Hey, church family, welcome back to the FBC Durant Podcast. I'm Garrett. I'm Sarah. And I am Corey. Um, you are on episode three of the Upfront Trilogy of the podcast, so Let's we got to go. really bring it home. Yeah. How, come, how come you're wearing the same clothes as you had on in the first two episodes? <laughs> I don't know. We're Spin definitely along. not marathoning these. It's <laughs> <laughs> coincidence. Not happening. We have a uniform for every episode. That <laughs> yeah, we're it'll just be it's this like from now like, on. Okay. It's like an animated cartoon. We just have our respective clothes. <laughs> I, I love it. So, um, <laughs> don't have to do that laundry it's faithfully. <laughs> Gary, if you uh, weren't the pastor, where would you sit in the sanctuary? I mean, obviously, you just preach and you go up front, but come on. And why? Strategy. So It matters. So any real estate, where would you pick? I'm thinking <laughs> that I'm going to go um, middle section aisle seat, mm. far enough back that the AC vents are hitting Ooh. me pretty good. <laughs> so you're just thinking about row six or seven. Okay. Probably getting close to where our college students start. Okay. Um, but I like that middle section because it's more ergonomically correct. Well, side sections, you're like, am I at the angle to look at him? Yeah. And, you know, I kind of got a broken back. So, you know, that's, but I'm that's thinking, fair. I'm thinking row five, six, left aisle. I, AC. Sit, on, I sit on the side sections so and now I'm feeling judged. Like I'm <laughs> sitting wrong. <laughs> are you turned all the way toward me or are you just kind of looking? I also sit in the aisle, so I kind of I got the leg room. I can kind of, you yeah. know, turn right there. I can have the armrest. So I, 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 I watch you when I Doesn't preach. I know what you do. Yeah, yeah. that's intimidating. <laughs> so I, I make faces at Gary. <laughs> Try to make him break. So <laughs> you bellus elbows him. <laughs> Just like stop. It's pretty cool. That's great. So on episode three, though, we are going to talk about church membership. Why is it important, Gary? Is it important? Does it matter? Does it matter? <laughs> These Those, are the big questions. That was dramatic. Does it matter? So, I mean, the reason I think you got to ask the question, does church membership matter, is because there is a growing sentiment in culture in general, independent, mm -hmm. non-reliant. Um, by the way, let's say this real quickly, though, when I talk about church membership. I said earlier that it's not helpful if there's meaningless membership, if we're not vetting people, if we're not. Uh, making sure that, that their testimony is valid so that we don't do them more harm than good. But it's also true that a church membership experience can be kind of oppressive. Some churches can, can kind of remove the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Priesthood of the believer says that you guys as church members don't need me or any of our pastors to go between you and the Lord. You can go directly to the Lord because you have the Holy Spirit in you. You know, so there is a priesthood that re resides within each believer. So that means that a church, while it has some authority and while we affirm and oversee each other's walk with Christ, there is an extreme that you can go to where we domineer over all of our members. And we don't want to be that either. So if you've experienced any kind of domineering or any kind of lording over you, an authoritarian kind of uh, pastorship, eldership, leadership of a church, then you tend to want to go, I don't want to submit to membership because I feel like I'm responding to something that was too authoritarian over me. And so I think we have to look at what we think the scripture says and say, what did it look like the early church was supposed to function like? By the way, it's another careful, uh, there's a caveat there in that um, if we try to look exactly what the New Testament looked like, there's a little bit of a difference in culture from then to now. So we have to try to take the spirit of what we see in the New Testament and kind of remember those like transparencies on overhead projectors. We kind of have to overlay it onto the current culture and say, what is the spirit of what was being practiced in the text? What do we think its dynamic equivalent is now? Because people say, you're not a New Testament church. None of us are because none of us are in Corinth, right? None of us are in Ephesus. None of us were being persecuted here like they were then. And the elders, the multiplicity of elders that they had was probably an elder for each house church of kind of an underground church. Well, that's not us. So to say, if you don't have a plurality of elders, you're not doing it right, is not exactly true because they were probably individual elders of house churches that were kind of managing a larger group of believers that were meeting in secret. Now, I do believe in a plurality of elders, don't get me wrong. But let's not act like we can overlay what we're doing to what they did in the New Testament and it'd be exactly right. If that's the case, get rid of air conditioners, right? And we can't have running water either. 
because they didn't back then, mm -hmm. right? So if you respond, you look at the scriptures and you go, here's what we think we saw. We saw a group of people who knew who was with them and who was not. You read the book of Acts, it makes a great case for church membership. You see, you know, you look at a certain chapter, so many people were with them. You go, who was counting? I don't know. Um, you get to a few more chapters later, here's the number of men only. Get to the next chapter, you know. At some point, the followers of the way were about, what, 70? Somebody's keeping track of who's with them. It keeps growing, right? And then when, like, Saul went to persecute people, how did he know who to persecute? They knew who were part of the church and who weren't. And so then you get to a place of like establishing deacons and they go, you know, the deacons need to kind of know who's going to be taken care of and who's not. Do you think they took care of every person or the people who were part of that group of believers? Right? Like you read the book of Acts, they were taking names and keeping count and knew who was with them. They knew who was not with them. And then the next big case practically is if the pat if the pastor and the elders of a church are responsible to shepherd members and if members are responsible to submit to the leadership of certain elders, who do you submit to? Do you three submit to every pastor in Bryan County? Am I responsible for every Christian in Bryan County? Or should I be responsible for every church member who submits themselves under my leadership and the leadership of our church through First Baptist Church membership? And are you responsible to submit to the pastors of First Baptist Church because you've, you've surrendered some of your preferences and privileges to be a part of this fellowship as members? Am I convincing you? I think it's, I think it's a strong argument. Mm -hmm. You look at what happened in Acts. You looked at they knew who was with them. You see the requirements for submission between leaders and people, and you go... We need to know who's with us and who's not. And we need to also do them the service that we talked about in episode one of let's not do them more harm than good by giving them a false sense of security that they're a part of our church if we don't even really know that they're a part of the kingdom of God. I think that's the basic case for church membership. If you look at the New Testament, let's see if I can wake my phone up here, you see a few things that God has always made a clear distinction between his people and the world. Deuteronomy 7, Numbers 5, Leviticus 13, 2 Corinthians 6. You see that Jesus established the church to affirm and mark and oversee his followers. Matthew 16, we talked about that. Matthew 18. By the way, when you look in Matthew at the concept of binding and loosing, some folks have interpreted the fact that whatever you bind in heaven that he told his followers, uh, whatever you bind on, uh, what does it say? Whatever is you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So people run around and go, I have all this unchecked authority to bind and loose things. And then they start thinking it means like possessions and money. I can just determine how rich I'm going to be and how much stuff I'm going to have. No, binding means he's talking about people saying that the church will make the earthly decision of who are followers of Christ eternally. We will vet people and together mark off who's a part of the followers of Christ. We don't determine who goes to heaven, only he does that. But we make an earthly determination of who are legit followers of Christ in the local church. He gave his followers that when he gave the keys to the kingdom to Peter after Peter's confession in 16, he gave the apostles thus the disciples, thus every church member that's come after that, we together are to affirm and oversee each other's membership in the kingdom of God. We do that together. We vet. We double check. We confirm. We affirm. He gave them that job. But the binding and loosing is the adding of people to your church body. Loosing is the removal of people from your church body. And so you see that there, marking and affirming the followers. Then um, the early New Testament church bears the evidence of church membership. That's my case I just made from Acts. And then remembering that church membership is beneficial for the individual church member, Ecclesiastes 4.10, 1 
1 Corinthians 12. You know, the 1 Corinthians 12 passage is the one that talks about God has placed the members of the body just as he pleased. He's arranged the church. And, and that's an important concept. So I would say to anyone who goes, is church membership important? I would say yes, because the New Testament bears out that they knew who was with them and who was not. Secondly, I would say it's beneficial to the church member, provides them a service and accountability and protection, right? Why do I discipline my children and tell them they're part of my family and this is not how McNeil's act? Because I want them to be decent human beings. Mm -hmm. Why do we each say we find a brother in sin, a sister in sin, we call them to accountability and repentance and say, that's not how children of God act. We're doing a disservice to his name. It's the same principle there. And then I would say uh, leaders have no clue who they're responsible for and members have no clue who they're submitting to if we don't have a church membership process. And so you've got what I said before is kind of oppressive church membership. You see, we want to avoid that. We're not, I'm not anyone's Holy Spirit. I don't want to be your guru. I don't want you to think you have to come to me to get to God. But we also don't need to have willy-nilly meaningless church membership where there's no accountability and, and no expression of accountability and authority together. And so that's kind of something we're shooting for. Okay, I would say the goal of church membership is our pillars. Yeah. Right? When you join our church, what's our goal? That you'll engage in worship, that you'll connect with people, that you'll grow deeper, and that you'll leverage it all for the sake of the gospel. That's a goal of church membership. You guys have any thoughts or questions on that before I scroll down to the next thing? What would you say to like people who are like dead set on not joining a church? Like they're not anti-church, but or like, you know, they're, they're Christian, but they just don't see the point because uh, either they're commitment phobes or they just genuinely don't even want to go down and have to do the shake the hand thing. That is literally a thing that I've heard people say that I'm not joining a church because you'll make me stand in front of everybody. And then even the fact that you can consume sermons by anyone in the world. I mean, you can literally find any church sermons probably anywhere, whether it's a celebrity pastor like Matthew Chandler or John Piper down to just local churches. It's like, I can, I can engage with church on my own and I don't need to go do the covenant <laughs> membership with someone, you know, or with a church. Like, what would you say to them that are just like, they're, they're, they're digging their heels in the sand? Well, I would say there's, there's several different answers to each scenario. I would say, like, uh, while I encourage our people to kind of de declare their membership publicly, I don't require it. So a uh, little known secret here. It's not secret anymore. But if someone says that's just a thing for me, if they're committed to our church and and they're showing up and they're you know they're meeting people and they're in small group and things and and uh, I'm not saying like we have a list, but if it's obvious that they're going to want to be a part of the church and they express that desire and they go through the steps. Um, we don't make that person walk forward. We tell people we'd love them to because it announces them to the, a larger church body. So it's like making one announcement makes it a little bit easier to then announce them to instead of a million small introductions, you get one start with an introduction. You know. I also think when people come forward, it's a good example to people that, hey, we're willing to publicly identify with this body. But it would be a pharisaical thing to require that for membership. So we don't require that. We just encourage it. So I'll let you off the hook on that one. So you heard uh, it here, folks. You don't have to go down front. <laughs> you, you heard it here. Cor Corey pulled it out of me. <laughs> um, uh, I, I do get a bonus of $300 for everybody who walks forward. Oh, okay. And so <laughs> keep that in mind as well. <laughs> That's not yeah. true. He winked for okay. you audio. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> It's audio for the audio. <laughs> Gary lied. Okay. Um, it's 500. Anyway, um, no, that's a lie too. But then I would say things like to, to the person who's afraid of the commitment, um, the problems, I say this in love, but the problems on their end are not ours. Um, we don't have an authoritarian, oppressive style of things. We want to provide you with cover and protection. We want you to have the blessing of walking with a group of people. We want you to have spiritual covering. The, when you watch the animal planet and stuff, Nat, Nat Geo, you know, the animals that get eaten are the ones that get off by themselves, right? 
And when Fair. you're in that big old pack of zebras and wildebeest, you normally don't get eaten. And we don't want uh, anyone to be off isolated where the the devil who prowls around like a lion um, can devour you. And so there's a lot of protection offered. There's a lot of encouragement. Um, there's a little bit of accountability. There is, but it's it's done in such a spirit of love and support that to be afraid of that commitment, I think, is to not understand the whole case I just went through with Acts and what the scripture really bears out. Now, we'll still bear with you in love, and we'd rather you attend for a long time and not join than, than get scared away about joining and quit attending because mm. we have a better chance to know your heart and you to know our heart, you know, if we stay together. So, but we do want to move toward a level of, of, of a baseline of commitment. The other thing I would say is going back to the case for membership, that's one of the requirements before you become a teacher or lead in certain capacities in our church is that you're a member. We wouldn't want to sign people up to teach our children who we haven't vetted what they believe about the Bible. Right. You wouldn't want your children taught by somebody who hasn't been vetted well about what they believe about the Bible and our church's statement of faith and things. So it gives us a baseline to make sure we're in agreement for everyone's protection and the good of the whole body. I'd say that if you're afraid of the commitment to the local church, you're probably a little bit too focused on you and maybe not enough focused on the good of the whole body and and what that does. But I still, again, don't want that to sound harsh and judgmental, but just that's how it would challenge you. With that, what is the church missing out on by that person not committing? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, if a person won't commit to the membership process, the church – can't know where they stand on their theology, their methodology, their personality. The church is robbed of an opportunity to get to know them better. The church is robbed of their gifts if they're gifted in teaching. Um, I've known folks in both of my churches uh, who have not, you know, been able to teach because they wouldn't join the church for some kind of surface level reasons. And but they're gifted as teachers, so they withhold the gift. From the Lord and His people, mm -hmm. maybe that person is is really missions minded. Maybe uh, I know each of you have served on different teams and committees and stuff. The air, the ways you've served in, had you not joined, you know, um, you wouldn't be sitting in those positions. And so, it just makes sense. Let's just both agree from a certain level. Let's just both agree that we fall in line and that we're committed to the same things and we think the in the same basic ways about the gospel. Did you have you had a third one, Corey? Was there another one you said? Well, like, I mean, just it was mainly like nowadays it's so easy to just be like, well, I can kind of create my own personal church. Yeah. Like Matt Chandler's my pastor because I just listen to his sermons every week, you know, but yeah, kind of that thing where it's just like, no, I'm engaging and I kind of just created my own bubble of a church and how I do things. Yeah. I, I think, I think at that point, again, you're, you're feeding yourself and you're not contributing to a body. Mm -hmm. And uh, you may be pulling some things that help you in your worldview or something. You're obviously not getting any community. You're obviously not giving any contribution. And, and the other thing that I've said that to guys over the years, you know, every once in a while as a pastor, it can be, I'll, if we can be vulnerable for a minute, every once in a while somebody says something like, you know, pastor, I, I love hearing you preach, you know. I listen to two other guys before you, and they list guys at mega churches and stuff, you know, and I listen to a guy after you, and, you know, you're my fourth favorite of the four. And, um, and by the way, I'm a little low on my tie this month because I got to send off my money down to this big church and that ministry, you know, because they've blessed me so much. In that moment, you have to ask yourself, did that bother me for my honor or God's honor? And I finally got to a place where I really believe it's God's honor that it bothered me for because. Those resources, I'm not saying you can't give money to another church, but those resources and that time and that commitment and that loyalty they feel to that person, they've created a loyalty and a relationship that's not real. Mm -hmm. That person, they don't get to see their flaws. You guys get to know your leader's flaws, and you get to know their sins and their warts and their family and their problems, and you don't get to know that from the guy you watch on TV. And again, while not making it a competition, that guy's not doing your 
family member's funeral. Mm -hmm. Guy's not texting you to see how you're doing when you're sick. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the church offers you both from pastors and lay people a connection to their world, an awareness of their reality, a view into their weaknesses, ministry you receive from them, ministry you give to them. None of that can happen through a screen. Mm, yeah, no, I agree. I did. I, I liked Garrett's question because I never thought about the reverse of how does the church benefit someone? Because I, I don't know about all of y'all, but I went through a church membership's bogus phase in my twenties, where I think I, I was the youth pat like pastor at the church, and I wasn't technically a member until some of the older guys cornered me in a dark room and said, "You have to join the church. This is stupid," <laughs> and said, and I, and I appreciated it. They were church very honest well. and blunt, but like. I went through that phase and I think even at the time it was very much like, uh, I don't know, probably just rebellion in some way. Um, but like to think about people who do do that, like go, well, I can just listen to this celebrity or like celebrity pastor or just any pastor of choice. Um, I can still hang out with my Christian friends. I can build a community, but I like that Garrett brought up that it's like, yeah, but a church just got robbed of like your like contribution to a ministry because, you know, they're not going to let you serve in the nursery unless you're a member and you can be vetted in some way. I mean, you're just going to, you're not contributing to a church. You're just contributing to yourself. That's right. So that's, that's interesting. I never thought about that. Well, as we introduced our mission vision pathway, um, our church, I'm thankful our church has a developmental way of growing in your faith, yeah. you know, outside of the pathway that's been provided. You know, you are piecing it together. Uh, not to mention that I can pick the sermons of that pastor. I can skip over that one that may uh, hit a little too deep or mm -hmm. hit too close to home. Whereas we, we, we live in real time when you're a part of a church. And so whatever the Lord has for you that Sunday and the body, um, that's what you have to deal with as a member. And that pathway allows you to develop. The word that sticks out in our, our pathway is spiritual maturity. That's the one I thought on the most mm -hmm. when you wrote it out. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's development. Mm -hmm. And you can't develop if you're not in the path mm -hmm. for you. And... When you're present with a local pastor, local leader, local life group leader, even even a journey group leader, some leadership that God's put as a covering and blessing to you in a local church, there is a, there is a specific nature of how they've been praying. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't prepare my sermons. I don't sit around and think about, well, where's Garrett bad and where's Corey bad and where's Sarah bad and I need to line them out. But if I'm, but if I'm studying a tough passage— and I, God brings to mind the plight of some of our people and maybe their struggles. My heart gets connected in the sermon with them. Mm. And I think, man, at that point, while I'm, I'm not going to preach at that person, I pray the Holy Spirit ministers a healing word to them if I know they're hurting or if I know they're grieving or if they're... Um, so there's like a personal, local thing that happens with within a church where we all want to honor the word and it's the universal gospel to the to the whole world. But we think of it and pray and prepare it with our local context in mind, knowing that our church has a personality, knowing that our people have tendencies and things. And that doesn't happen if we're pulling ministry from an outlet. Mm. Mm. No, that's good too. I've not, I haven't considered that either. Like if you're kind of doing your own thing, because you're speaking of like a lack of connection and accountability that if, uh, if I'm just doing my own thing, if I'm just listening to John Piper sermons and reading only C.S. Lewis books, and I've just got my circle of Christian friends and I'm calling that church. But like, if all of a sudden I'm like, I'm like stumbled into some sort of like, like pornographic sin, right? I can, I can build walls. I can be like, oh, I don't, John Popper's going to talk about pornography. I'm skipping this one. Yeah. Or, um, oh, my friend started kind of asking me about stuff and I'm going to like not hang out with them as much. So like, it, I've never thought about that either. It's easy to like navigate kind of dangerous waters when you're out on your own. It, I guess it goes back to your analogy of the zebra and yep. the lion. You're, you know, you kind of, you wander off 
doing your own thing and building your own walls and you're setting yourself up for a lot of failure, spiritual failure. And as you were speaking, it reminded me that it also leads to that pedestal mentality because if all I hear is someone preach or teach, I build the best version of themselves in my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like when we do life together and we really know each other, Mm -hmm. you know that you're hearing the word preached by me or by your life group leader or whoever you're receiving from. And if you're teaching, they know they're receiving it from a flawed human being who's seeking Jesus the same as them. That's good. I think it reduces like the that. guru pedestal mentality to be engaged in a mm-hmm. local church. I like that. That's good. So what does being a member of our church look like practically? Like how can we walk that out and what does that look like in practice? Okay. I want to answer it in two ways. I want to answer it kind of formally what's in our Discover FBC book which is like, if you think scripturally, what practical mm-hmm. church membership, this is it. And then I want to talk about how we do it here. Okay. Um, a church body formally affirms an individual's profession of faith and baptism is credible. That's that's the first thing. That's that vetting we talk about. The church promises to give oversight to that individual's discipleship. So when you join the church, we're saying, we want to help you walk with Christ to spiritual maturity, right? Mm-hmm. The individual formally submits his or her discipleship to the service and authority of this body and its leaders. So when we say we're committed to you, you say back, I'm committed to you guys too. Everything we say and do is based on a biblical foundation of love, even church discipline. By the way, speaking of church discipline, every once in a while I get asked by someone, and sometimes it's a person who kind of maybe assumes that, uh, they know stuff that we don't or that, that they think something's not happening. And they'll be like, how come, how come we don't do church discipline here? Mm-hmm. And I had a friend who I really respect ask me that question. They didn't ask it from a spirit of pride, but they asked me that question out of curiosity later. And I said, how do you know we don't? Mm-hmm. As the lead pastor, I initiate church discipline all the time. If one of my friends who I love is stuck in a sin and it is viewable. It's a little bit of church discipline when people have watched me struggle with my weight if I'm acting in a gluttonous way. And this will go in the weeds for a minute, but it's not a sin to be heavy. It's a sin to be a glutton. And so if people see me knocking down, you know, seven sweet teas and eating sugar all day while I'm heavy and they say, Pastor, this seems to be a sin issue. That's a little bit of church discipline. That's a Christian saying, you're in observable, open sin that's not repentant, right? You think about it, we all initiate a little bit of church discipline with a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ at Mm -hmm. times. When we call them out, call them to accountability, that kind of thing. So I don't go, hear you, hear you, we are starting church discipline. But I start it, and our staff starts it, and ladies in our church start it when they see it. And then we follow the Matthew 18 principles of witnesses and stuff. And then, so church discipline happens around here a lot. But church discipline, if it's done well, won't be something that's a spectacle for more people to view than have to. If the sin is private, you try to keep the discipline private. The more public the sin becomes, the more public the discipline has to become. Or it appears as if there's no consequence and no holiness being being required Mm. so a little side trail but those are those are some things of how it looks in the scripture around here we want to do those same things we're going to ask you to come sit in on a couple of membership interviews with us a minimum of two sometimes it's five if the people like to share a lot about their testimony Mm -hmm. right we run out of time Mm -hmm. sometimes it's two uh Oftentimes it's three or four, but we're going to ask the people asking to become a member to share their story with us in as much detail as possible. We want to hear about their life. We care about their story. We feel like we understand each other better when we've heard each other's stories. Mm -hmm. So now when Corey Williams starts popping off movie lines and stuff and, and dresses with impeccable fashion and he tells me his story, I, I know a little bit about his 
background. And so I understand a little bit where he's coming from. People know about some of the abuse and stuff in my past. They know why I respond certain ways to certain things. And so we understand each other more. We, we care about each other. We hear, we hear the salvation. We affirm that that testimony is credible according to the scriptures, not according to our whims. And then we ask them to fill out a little bit of a request for church membership, a couple of pages, mainly so the man who does most of the membership interviews won't lose the information in memory. And so they write out their testimony and so they understand the gospel stuff. Then we hear those, and then we talk about spiritual gifts, and we give them a spiritual gift inventory, and we talk about what they're passionate about, where they want to serve, so that if we need someone in the nursery, we won't go ask the person who hates children to work in the nursery. Maybe we'll ask the person that says, I love working with babies to work in the nursery. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll ask the people who are better at technology to work with the media, and so on and so forth, by looking at spiritual gifts and having them write down the areas they want to serve it and stuff. Then we give them a, we tell them a little bit about the stuff in Discover FBC. We hand them a book. We give them a chance to answer questions and things. And that's what the membership interviews kind of look like. It's really conversational, much like what we've done tonight. I mean, these three different times we filmed and way before 11 o'clock. And so um, it's very informal, but yet it's an important step for us to hear their story, affirm that as credible. And then after that process, we go to one of our quarterly business meetings and our members take the recommendations of our pastors and they vote to affirm people as official members of our congregation. Short answer is it's mostly done through conversations with our pastors mm -hmm. and then affirmed by our membership. Good. I mean, this is how it looked for me. I don't know about you guys. I a became a member before Gary came. I think Sarah, to yeah, it's been a while. Sarah and I got, we might need to redo Sarah's <laughs> membership. Yeah. <laughs> slipped right in here. You got got married to Cole in. and boom. She's sweating over there. <sighs> don't make me go down front. No, I'm just kidding. Check her records. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. So how long have each of you been a member of our church? You're probably the longest timer. Mm -hmm. Well, Cole probably. might be the longest timer. That's true. It's definitely Cole. Cole, Cole, you're off camera, but what year did you become a member? But when when were you baptized? So he was seven when he was baptized. So Cole's probably been a member about 21 years. Okay. I'm about 18. Wow. I was, I was 20. I wow. Think, when I moved here, yeah. So. <laughs> you're aging gracefully. Yeah. <laughs> when did Searles get here? Three years ago. Okay, because I joined the week before him, so I could have seniority over him. <laughs> <laughs> so, And he joined, he, he wanted to get here just in time for me to take the staff on a little fishing outing that we did. So yeah. we know where his I just know I yeah. beat him by a week. So You beat him by a week. So a little over three years for you. Okay. I've been just a to prove he didn't join because of that. Four, I've been a member for seven, probably seven and a half years. I joined right before me and Cole got married. It's romantic. So really, none of us have anything on Cole. No. No. Uh, I became a <laughs> member here in 2005. I've been a member for 19 years with a four-year hiatus. So 15 years or 19 years Depending. plus a four-year hiatus? Uh, 19 years without the four years hiatus? That's right. Okay. Yeah, so 15 total. Gotcha. Coming up on 19 from when I started. Gotcha. So there's value. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I believe there's value to belonging to a people. Anything else? One thing I would add about this conversation of being a church member is that if you're outside of a church family right now, maybe outside of First Baptist Church, um, outside of any church, maybe you have been in a church before and you were hurt um, we take that seriously. We know that each church, including ours, can leave wounds for people because our church is made up of people and people are flawed. Um, we we want to just encourage you that the Lord can heal those wounds and that you can have experiences that are more positive than that in churches. Um, if you've if you've been de-churched, maybe if if you've had a bad experience, or maybe if you've just maybe your worldview has changed and you feel like, okay, I don't believe the same way I used to. I would just say to you that 
I think First Baptist Church would be a great place for you to come see what God is doing. Just sit under the teaching of God's word through our other teachers and pastors and myself. Enjoy fellowship of people and just allow God a chance to minister to your heart and to show you his goodness once again. The church is flawed, but our Savior is perfect and his love for you is great. And I would also say this, if it's not First Baptist Church, find a Bible-believing, Christ-centered church and and give those folks another shot because they're never going to be perfect, but there are a lot of good churches and a lot of good people who love you, and you're too valuable to not let God um, continue to speak to you and these people to have a chance to pursue your heart. Amen. Well, that wraps up the trilogy of we did it. <laughs> Discover Let's FBC go. Durant. Um, uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, anything else? I, I really don't know how to close this. Pick up the book. If you are more curious, there's a lot more information in the very well done books that we have. Discover FBC. You can pick up the church office. Um, anytime you're at the church, come grab one. And make sure you tell your friends about these episodes. Yeah, like, click, subscribe. Are we on YouTube? <laughs> Wait, oh, yeah. we are. No. Comment, hit the QR code that's right here. And then I also <laughs> want to challenge everyone to tune in for episode four to see if these jokers are wearing the same clothes.